Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, chronic daily migraine survivor, and founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation. I am here today with Dr. Tim Smith. Dr. Smith is the CEO of Study Metrics Research. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you today? Doing well, thanks. So we are here today with Dr. Smith because we have an awesome update on the Norivia device. And we awesome, we often, excuse me, bring Dr. Smith on uh, when we are talking about new data related to either a medication or a device because he does so many clinical trials and he's very knowledgeable in this area. So um, we are um, going to talk about this and we're gonna talk about it because it's real world data. So we often sit around and wait after either a new device or new medicine comes out because we have data from clinical trials, but that's often very different from what happens after patients in the real world start either using the device or taking the medicine. And we're always curious what's gonna happen. Well, we got this fast in this instance, and we're gonna talk about some stuff that was published about this device today. So uh, Dr. Smith, can you start by reminding us what uh, Norivium is, what it looks like? Yeah, so uh, we had done a previous podcast on medical devices, and this was the one that is what they call remote electrical neuromodulation. It sounds like a mouthful, and it is, but uh, some people abbreviate it REN, remote electrical neuromodulation. And, and uh, there are several different neuromodulators on the market now. This one is the one, and I have uh, one of them right here. It's a it's a device, and it uh, this one is the one that goes on the arm, on arm and right uh, on the upper arm. You know, you peel off the backing, and it uh, and it and it sticks on the arm, and it has a little uh, blood pressure cuff looking thing that you slide over to hold it in place, mm -hmm. and it applies electrical stimulation to the skin, and and these uh, nerve uh, endings take that signal to the central nervous system, and it has a suppressing effect or a it enhances the brain's ability to uh, inhibit uh, pain uh, uh, stimulation. So uh, by stimulating other nerves, you can suppress the actual migraine uh, uh, nerve traffic. And so um, it's passed all the uh, clinical trials, it's FDA approved, it's marketed, uh, and it is marketed for uh, acute migraine treatment in adults. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, that's that's what it is, and that's how it's used. Uh, the other important point to make about it is, uh, you, it is uh, connected uh, by Bluetooth to your phone, and there's an app that you use to control it, to turn it on, to turn it off, and so on and so forth. So it's it, uh, it uses a lot of new technology and sort of advanced ways to try to help patients uh, recover from their migraine attacks more quickly and effectively. Right. So the fact that it is uses utilizes the patient's cell phone is really important to what we're talking about today because um this is why we got data real world, world data so quickly um the data came goes to the cell phone and is sort of de-identified and then they were able to use that data to publish pretty quickly how this is working in the population correct Yep, and so the way it does, uh, you know, so the patients use the app to turn the device on and it runs for 45 minutes, that's a treatment. So, um, and uh, what uh, the app does is it prompts the patient to uh, describe their headache, tell how severe it is at baseline, and then it uh, will send a message to them, ping them in two hours and ask them to rate it again, and then 24 hours later, and that's, they capture those data endpoints for as many uh, migraine attacks as the patient treats, and they get the data for as many of those attacks that the patient actually enters the data for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, what exactly did they find out from this data that they got? Uh, so they, they uh, crunched the numbers on this uh, very large uh, group of, of uh, patients that were using them, using the device and uh, they, they split these out into two different categories. One was for patients who were getting care from a headache specialist, and then they had a smaller group of patients who were getting care from a non-headache specialist, like a primary care doctor or a general neurologist, for example. And uh, they, they looked at 
the uh, pain relief rates and the pain freedom rates at that two hour mark that we, we talk about so much. <clears throat> Did they, did they do that? Did they break it out by provider? Were they trying to get at, did they assume that people seeing headache specialists had worse migraine conditions or more chronic migraine or something like that? That would be the presumption. And okay. having worked both in a primary care office and in a, in a headache uh, specialty clinic, uh, that's generally the case. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the patients that get referred or self-referred to a headache clinic are typically more of the chronic or higher uh, frequency uh, patients that uh, may have failed other treatments before. So yes, you could consider them to be a, a more difficult, uh, you know, have a more difficult brand of, of migraine to treat. Okay, and what was the success rate? How did the device seem to perform in the real world? Now, so in the, uh, when you look at pain relief, which is that uh, going from a moderate or severe uh, migraine to uh, mild or none, uh, the headache specialty clinic patient population uh, got uh, pain, 59% of them got pain relief in 50% or more of their headaches. It's a little different way that we look at the data on that, uh, uh, but that was the measure that they reported on. And then the other was uh, for the non-headache specialist uh, uh, patients who were getting care for the non-headache specialists, the, that number was 74% that uh, got pain relief and 50% or more of the ta uh, their attacks. So 59% and 74%. And then when you looked at the more strict measure of complete pain relief, so patients go from moderate to severe down to zero migraine pain at all within two hours, uh, those numbers look different, but they're sort of in line with what you would expect. And what we see is in the headache specialty clinic, 20% of the patients achieved that complete pain freedom in two hours with uh, for 50% of their headaches or more. And uh, the non-headache specialty patients were, uh, that number was 36. So 36% of uh, patients achieved that uh, pain freedom in two hours for at least 50% of their attacks. And one other day, a bit of information I'll just throw in there is that they did track adverse events. So they asked patients if they had any side effects or adverse experiences from using the device. And that number came back to be less than 0.5% of the migraines treated had any type of adverse events at all to report. Okay. Those are pretty high numbers for relief um, for any device that we talk about together. So that is good news that real world data came back with those high numbers. Um, let's just remind people since we didn't talk about it at the start, were there any side effects when it came out of clinical trials? Uh, the side effect profile looks uh, really good and even okay. in the clinical trials, uh, but uh, adverse events that were reported to the investigators in the trial were very low and most of them were not attributable to the device. Okay. Uh, and the ones that were tended to be tingling or maybe some skin redness at the site that was transient and, and uh, resolved spontaneously. Okay. So overall, this is pretty positive information um, for a migraine treatment. Those are pretty big numbers, am I right? Yeah, pretty big numbers. I would remind our viewers to be careful how you compare this to other trial results, though, because this is real world data and they are reporting a little different <clears throat> way of reporting that number. So a, a percent of, of uh, pain relief within two hours for 50% of the attacks, you see. So that's a little different than what's, uh, what's commonly reported in the clinical trials. So just uh, not saying it doesn't work and obviously it does work well and uh, these results uh, demonstrate that, but uh, to look at it uh, to another device or to the previously reported data from the clinical trials, it may look a little different and it's because it is different. It's not looking at the same endpoints in the same population and the same treatment paradigms that we would have had in the clinical trials. So you can't take these numbers and compare them directly to other numbers from clinical trials. It's not the same, uh, it's not the same number and it's not the same type of population or as stringent a protocol as clinical trials done um, done before a device is released into the real world. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to add um, on this new data that we have seen in the real world from Nerevio Migra? 
I think it's impressive that we actually have a better way of, of tracking real world data. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, for other experiences in trying to track real world data, researchers have looked at uh, insurance claims databases and things like that, and maybe harvest some data from electronic medical records, but none of those sources actually track moment to moment responses like this. The only time you could ever capture any real world data uh, in anything close to this would be if uh, patients, you know, went to their computer, for example, and logged into a platform and documented their, their information about their headache attacks uh, as like uh, participating in a registry or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, you know, when the patient, the, the, the technology has really uh, enabled this to, to this kind of, these kinds of data to be gathered and interpreted because you have to use your phone to turn the device on and your phone prompts you to answer the questions. So it makes it a lot easier and we get much more robust uh, participation at the patient level. So it gives us something to, to uh, and it's kind of like the new way of doing things, so, uh, so to speak. So researchers will be happy to have this. Whether we someday uh, can utilize this kind of technology in a real world setting to enable the FDA to approve devices or medications in a much more efficient way, it's anybody's guess. Some people would like to think that will be the case somewhere down the line, but we're, we're still uh, several good steps away from, from that being accomplishable at this time. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, and thank you everyone for joining us, and please join us again next week for Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. Bye-bye.